the revelation of a betrayal completely upends uh, our lives and our marriages. There seems to be such chaos that begins to spin as our mates begin to flood, as we try to control and keep things at least manageable. We keep trying to work on our own damage control. It's just that our natural responses in trying to help all of this uh, chaos, oftentimes uh, it's the last things we need to be doing. So I want to share with you the 20 most common mistakes that I see those of us who have been unfaithful making as we try to navigate uh, these rapids that have been created by the betrayal. And, and don't worry, I'm not judging anyone. These are ones that I've also committed on my own. So listen to these and see if you've made any, and hopefully you can also come out with some ideas of different ways of approaching this. Mistake number one, naively believing that if you and your affair partner decide to do the right thing and return to your marriages, that the affair is indeed over. This is a common misnomer. An affair typically will mean more to one person than another. You may or may not be the one that was most invested in this relationship, but there's a good chance if you make a decision to turn back to your marriage, even though you and your affair partner have agreed on this, that they may not be ready to fully let go. I think one of the biggest mistakes is the fact that we think affairs end bilaterally, that we both have to agree that this thing is done, when in, when in reality, affairs end unilaterally. It takes one person, you, has nothing to do with the affair partner, to ultimately decide, okay, I'm done, I'm over, it's out. And at that point, you move forward. But if you and your affair partner think it's about the two of you agreeing on this, that this is the course of action, quote, we're gonna take, then ultimately the two of you have created a covert alliance. You've decided together that you guys are gonna do something together with your marriages. The reason it's unilateral, you have to make that decision that you're doing this regardless of what happens with them. Because the probabilities of them continuing to reach out to you to want to reconnect, to reestablish something, will actually be quite high. I strongly recommend and that you read a series uh, on ending an affair. Please uh, go through that six-part series. It'll go a long way to helping you see what it's going to look like to end this thing. But don't think just because you say it's over and that the two of you have agreed to do this that that means anything's over. It'll take a lot more than that. Mistake number two leaking out information over time. Because of that sense of chaos that's occurred frequently, we want to try to manage the reaction by the flow of information. In fact, in my mind, I always wanted to try and control my mate's responses by the flow of information. I was scared to death to let her see everything. I was afraid if she knew everything that everything would be over that would be more than she could possibly handle. The problem, though, with leaking information over time is it only delays the ability to heal, delays the ability to reestablish trust. And every time you tell your mate, that's everything. And then new information comes out. Once again, you just chop their knees out from under them. And they're back at the beginning point, not being able to trust you. One of the first steps to reestablishing trust with your mate is to first trust them with the information. Failure to do that makes it so hard for them to find new trust. Now, I know that you're afraid what they might do if they have that information, how they might use it. I mean, ultimately, that's going to be their bad. But don't continue to leak information. Give your mate and yourself and your marriage a starting point. Get to ground zero where you're able to tell them everything so that the two of you can at least begin going into the next stages 
of recovery rather than delaying everything by leaking that information out. You can't ever get to the starting line until you first get the truth out. For more information about full disclosure, I would recommend you watch the video uh, Reaching Ground Zero. Also, you can read our four-part series called A Crucial Step to Surviving Infidelity Discovery. By watching that video and reading those articles. I believe you'll be a long way to correcting that initial mistake about leaking out information. Mistake number three, being defensive. Typically the revelation of a betrayal brings about such an onslaught of emotion and just incredible accusations and distortions of reality. It is so, so difficult not to try and control that process as it begins to happen. We desperately want our mate to see things as they really are, not as they're thinking in their own mind and all the things that they're making up and the accusations they're making of us that really aren't true. We want to correct all of that stuff. But you can't do that. Huge mistake to try to manage that initial onslaught. In uh, The Wizard of Oz, one of my favorite quotes is when Dorothy says to Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore, Toto. And at that moment, literally, this isn't about reasonable, this isn't about truth anymore, this is simply about someone that's incredibly hurt and is just venting and things are coming out and yes, reality is distorted. Being able to listen to that person and just let them go through that emotion and let those emotions flow without trying to be defensive and protect yourself and defend yourself, just letting them speak is a great first step. You really don't want to be defensive. Somebody when, uh, well at least when I talked to somebody initially uh, about this, he just had said, what's the consequence of sin? And I said, death. He said, good. So anything your mate does short of killing you is going to be mercy. And I began to look at her responses as really quite merciful. As long as Stephanie was still willing to speak to me, actually, I wasn't getting what I deserved. And I could sit there and just listen. And I could take it. And I could let her slowly let off the steam of all the hurt. But if I kept trying to make her push her emotions down and they kept going down, it was only going to increase the trauma that she would be experiencing as we went through all of this, that ultimately I needed to be able to be present and to be safe for her, which had nothing to do with defensiveness. So my suggestion to you, instead of being defensive and trying again to control things, be safe, let them talk, listen. Uh, if there's 5% right in what they're saying, just simply be able to say back to them, you're right, and agree with the part of them that you know is right. If they're completely off base, I would just sit there and say, I hear you. I, I understand why you would see it that way. I'll think about it. But don't tell them that what they're thinking or what they're going through is wrong. Don't invalidate all of that because there's something right. What's right about it is just that incredible flood. And you want to come to the place where you can help heal their trauma rather than exacerbated by telling them that they can't express things. Again, I'm not saying that it's okay to allow any sort of physical abuse or uh, being in a dangerous situation like that. But at least being safe enough for your mate to process will be huge. So don't be defensive. You'll really speed up the process if you can just listen. Hopefully it'll be a great first step to the two of you being able to reconnect. Number four believing everything your mate says. When people are really angry or when they're flooded and doing things, they're going to say things that ultimately they don't believe or they don't mean. And yet, farther down the line, once they calm down, they won't even believe that stuff anymore. Our problem is when they say things such as, I'm going to divorce you or you're this or you're that, we hang on to those negative statements and believe that's what they really think, and that's what's going to happen in the future. One of our worst mistakes is just sitting there, hanging on to those most negative things at the worst times, 
Let those things go. If you continue to live according to what they say in those moments, you'll be making a critical error. At the same time, please uh, don't minimize what your mate's saying. At least hear it. Don't be defensive. But understand that there's a really good chance they'll shift over time. Number five, living life as normal. You can't go on pretending everything is normal after betrayal if ultimately your goal is to help your mate heal. Oftentimes we want to just skip over things and pretend that nothing really bad happened, hoping that somehow by underreacting to things we won't cause our mate to overreact. But the fact is things aren't normal and you need to change lifestyle in order to help your mate be safe. But if you fail to do that, you're going to continue to trigger your mate and you won't create an environment that's safe for them to heal. So please, whatever you do, don't go on as if everything's normal. Instead, make the changes necessary to help your mate feel safe. Number six, trying to defend the affair partner. This is one that I made myself almost unconsciously, but oftentimes our mate will say things about our affair partner that seems absolutely off base. We want to somehow change the negative view to let them know that our fair partner really wasn't that bad or isn't the type of person that our mate is accusing them of being. But right at this point, that's going to be how your mate sees them. It'll change over time. But if you sit there and start defending them, all that's going to happen is you're going to sit there and betray your mate again. So at least be willing to listen to what your mate has to say about the affair partner and keep your mouth shut. Ultimately, like I said, the two of you will come to a common understanding, but don't defend them. Number seven, trying to avoid talking to your mate about their feelings. It's really painful when our mate begins to flood, when they begin to share everything they're feeling. Please remember, feelings just are. However, a critical error again is when we sit there and try to shut it down and we don't want to hear ultimately what they have to say. When we do that, we're only going to prolong the process. What I believe is if we take responsibility for our mate's feelings, they won't have to. A good example is a man who had taken his wife out on their anniversary to dinner. It's their one year anniversary. The waitress came up and introduced herself as Susan, which was the name of his affair partner. When she walked away, the gentleman turned to his wife and said, wow, I am so sorry. Are you okay? And she just said, yeah, I'm better now. Simply by acknowledging her feelings, not trying to ignore it, letting her process through her feelings, allowed her to feel he actually cared. And when we let them process feelings, they're going to feel we care. And that connection's going to happen. But if we sit there and try to shut them down, they'll only escalate and they'll feel like they really don't matter to us. Number eight, pointing out your mate's flaws and failures. It's really tempting when we get into a situation like this to point out everything that's wrong with them or everything that was wrong with the marriage as a way of justifying why we did what we did. The only problem is bad marriages, my spouse's bad behavior doesn't cause me to make any sort of choice. And it's really a serious mistake when you begin to blame those things rather than taking personal responsibility. All marriages have problems, I certainly understand that. And at some point those problems need to be addressed. But in recovering from infidelity, it's sequential, not concurrent. We first have to deal with the pain caused by the infidelity and reestablish a firm commitment. Then we can deal with the other problems in the relationship. But those things have to happen more or less in sequence. So don't begin by pointing out your mate's flaws uh, as a way of justifying why you did what you did. Instead, just take responsibility for what you did. Number nine, taking your mate to the same places you visited with your affair partner. One of the problems that a recovering mate has is dealing with the triggers and all of the intrusive thoughts. Uh, 
When you take them to those particular places, all you're doing is adding to the reminders they'll experience. Typically, these people will experience maybe 50 to 100 triggers a day, and they'll have to deal with trying not to flood. It's a big mistake to exacerbate that problem by acting again as if nothing happened and continuing down those paths to the places that trigger them. Remember, you want to take responsibility for their pain so they won't have to. Number 10, telling a lie of any sort. One of your primary goals is to create safety for your mate so the two of you can begin to heal, so that she'll know or he'll know that you really care for them, that they matter to you, that you're doing what's necessary to help them. Any sort of lie is only going to destroy trust once again, and it will just reinforce the negative view they have of you. So don't make the mistake of lying. Just tell your mate, I would rather lose you than lie to you, and from here on out, I'm going to be truthful.